Bitcoin. Uh, like I said, my name is Stanislaw Vysotsky. I'm here to talk about fascism and anti-fascism and talk about these topics uh, broadly and maybe as part of the Q&A we can focus specifically on Wisconsin uh, rather than kind of starting with Wisconsin and kind of moving into that. So, I'm going to do an overview of fascism that basically consists of two parts. One of them is a discussion of classical fascism, and one of them is uh, the overview of more contemporary fascist elements, and then I'm going to talk about anti-fascism to kind of close things out. And again, like I said, I'm going to do this kind of broadly, and then we can get specific uh, in Q&A, or if you want to talk about details, things of that nature. Everybody can kind of follow along. So, in terms of talking about classical fascism, what we need to understand is the way in which classical fascism shares certain characteristics with and differs from contemporary fascist movements. So the framework that I use is one that was developed by Chip Berlay. Uh, it has something like 11 or 14 characteristics. I don't actually remember the exact count right now. So what I tried to do was synthesize his very, very many characteristics into a shorter framework that works really well. Uh, also, if you look at the handout, at the end I have some suggested readings, and uh, Shane Burley's fascism book uh, is a very good resource on understanding contemporary fascism, and has a very good definition as well. So just suggest that if you're interested in sort of learning more. But Chip Berlay defines classical fascism as having a set of key core characteristics, the first of which is nationalism and super patriotism. So that fascism is defined by an extreme form of nationalism that venerates the nation as something that is not just good, but as something that is great and has a historic mission of some form of domination, whether that domination is regional or global in its scope. And I'm gonna go kind of quickly through the aspects of classical fascism, so bear with me. We can talk about it again during Q&A. I just wanna leave as much time as possible for you for us to have a conversation. So nationalism, super patriotism, first kind of aspect of classical fascism. The second aspect of classical fascism is militarism and violence, which extends uh, somewhat naturally from this notion of nationalism and super patriotism. If there is a historic mission of domination, then of course uh, the nation is going to have to build a mass military, build a military that is focused on external domination and war, and build it through a culture of violence. And for fascism, <coughs> violence is not simply a means to an end. Violence is in and of itself a, an inherent spiritual aspect of fascist ideology. <coughs> that is that fascists understand violence to be not only good for the nation, that is something that builds national spirit, that brings people together, that gives them some sense of meaning and shows that kind of historic mission and ability to dominate in the world, but also that violence is good for the individual spirit. So that the violent individual, or the individual who is willing to carry out acts of violence, or at minimum support acts of violence, is a better spiritual human being than an individual who does not turn to violence in a fascist ideology. So fascists uh, have historically used a combination of street violence and state violence. So they use street violence in order to rise to power. Uh, as we know, you have the original brown shirts, you have Mussolini's black shirts, and so on and so forth. Uh, in various <coughs> nations, these kind of small fascist parties that have a violent wing that is used to intimidate uh, political enemies, uh, and that they often begin by intimidating political enemies, then they extend to intimidating uh, racial or ethnic others, or, or racial and ethnic enemies of the culture. So that's the street violence aspect. And then as they gain power, they turn and use that violence of the state. Because the state, as sociologist Max Weber points out, has a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. 
right? That, that we have police, we have military, they get to use force, and if we do the things that they do, we are criminalized, right? So the state has that monopoly on the use of force, and so fascists take that monopoly on the use of force and turn it again towards political enemies, towards people who are seen as enemies of the people or nature or the nation as a whole. Uh, and again, those are often racialized and ethnic others, outsiders as the fascists construct themselves. So that's the violence of the state. Now the interesting part is that when fascists take over a state, they not only use state violence and, and the sort of legal apparatus of the state to impose violence upon people, but they also use a combination of street violence as well. So the state engages in official violence, but then they sanction street violence as well. They, they allow the, the sort of thugs to walk the streets and engage in violence against enemies uh, with very little impunity. So we, we can see sort of the hallmarks of a fascist state as being one that allows both state violence and street violence. So that's the sort of notion of militarism and violence. The next aspect of classical fascism is an authoritarian hierarchy and a cult of personality. So classical fascism, as we understand it, uh, you know, certainly in its original formation with Mussolini, certainly with its sort of almost ideal typical pinnacle of Nazism under Adolf Hitler, and all the various fascist regimes that have existed throughout Europe, Latin America, certainly we're seeing with Duterte in the Philippines right now, uh, these kinds of regimes all have a cult of personality uh, built around the power of the leader. The leader is special. The leader has, again, rely on the sociologist Max Weber for the notion of a charismatic authority, right? Someone who leads by uh, virtue of their personality. There's something magical about them. So that, that's built into fascism. And then from that leader stems a complex hierarchy that people operate under. You know, a very strong bureaucracy. So as sociologists, uh, Sigmund Bauman points out that uh, the bureaucracy of the modern society is something that allowed uh, the Holocaust to occur because all of the sort of structural preconditions existed. And so the hierarchy that exists in a fascist society is one that everybody answers to. Everybody knows their place in the hierarchy. So there's a rigid kind of sense of hierarchy. And at the top is some sort of charismatic leader. So it's a notion of a cult of personality. Uh, fascism, and, and this is one of the more interesting aspects ideologically about it, as, as a system of ideas. Fascism sees itself as something new. It's something that's important to understand, because often we think of fascism as something that harkens back to another time. Uh, it does have a reactionary politics, but that reactionary politics is defined as inspiration more than a return to some previous era. So fascism constructs itself as something that is new and different and uses the language often of radicalism in the way it projects itself to the world. So that it is against modernity and modernism, the, the modern society, the technological society. So fascism often comes with a kind of romantic uh, love of nature. And of the you know, and that extends, of course, to the notions of racializing groups, because there is a sort of sense of nature there. So fascism uses that as a fight against industrialism, against the excesses of capitalism. So fascism posits itself as something that is better than capitalism. Certainly, laissez-faire capitalism that we have come to kind of understand in contemporary societies. Fascism posits itself also, however, as an alternative to socialism, to the ways in which socialism comes as a unifying internationalist force. So that fascism is better and different and avant-garde and something new that stands against modernity, stands against capitalism, stands against socialism, and stands against the failures of democracy. Because democracy is something that creates certain kinds of conditions that basically contradict the desires of fascists for a rigid authoritarian hierarchical control. And also for fascists, democracy is a failure. You know, it's government by the mob. If you don't mind, can we do questions oh, sure. after? Sorry. Is that okay? 
Yeah. Just because that way I can finish. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, so it is seen as a superior form of social organization. It is seen as a way of organizing the, the society uh, in order to reach some sort of new and revolutionary pinnacle of existence. Or at least that's the way they present themselves. And last but not least, classical fascism appeals to the mass of common folk to join in a historic mission. You know, it is a philosophy that uses a notion of common identity to bring people together, ordinary people, and give them a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, uh, a sense that what they are doing is more than simply voting every four years, or going to work, or organizing for their interests as workers, but that they are in fact doing something that is going to bring greatness to the people. So fascism uses these elements to organize the mass party, to organize the people together, to give them a sense that they are making their country great again. <laughs> so these are. This is a sort of a brief version of classical fascism. I certainly, can encourage you to look into aspects of classical fascism and how it operates. But then we have to look at contemporary fascism, because what we're looking at in terms of contemporary fascist movements is something that has similarities, but also has some interesting and unique differences from classical fascism. So contemporary fascism shares many of the characteristics of classical fascism. Uh, first and foremost, the notion of militarism and violence. Classical fascism and contemporary fascism both have a kind of fetishization of violence, a fetishization of the use of uh, war and violence against their against enemies, particularly when I'm talking about a kind of street-level populist fascism that we see in various groups and individuals. <clears throat> so there is this idea of violence as being part and parcel of the fascist identity. So that's the first aspect. Second aspect is that there is, again, this kind of reaction against modernism. That you see, if you do like I do in my research, where I read online conversations, and online discussions that these groups have, and these individuals have, what you see is a virulent hatred for the world as it is. And in, in some cases, they identify the symptoms correctly. They don't necessarily identify the causes correctly. But there's a hatred for the way in which globalization, deindustrialization, have shifted people's lives. So sort of hatred for the modern world. And then the causal aspect of it is that it is a set of conspiracies, largely Jewish conspiracies, and the product of multiculturalism. So they hate multiculturalism. They hate that our world is becoming a more diverse world. So we, we see that same kind of hatred of modernity. There is also the same kind of populism, right? That, that the common folks should join in that historic mission that there is a sense that everyday people haven't learned the truth, that the, the, the truth is out there, that the truth is something that they have as fascists and that is being hidden from view. So there's a lot of conspiracy theory that operates within these kinds of worlds and, and worldviews of contemporary fascism. And that people need to just learn and know, and if they will come to the struggle, then they will understand that we can all work together. So the populism is really there. And the other way to understand populism, and this is why the conspiracy theories flourish, is that populism is something that both attacks elites, certainly right-wing populism, you know, because there, there are different political variations on populism, but right-wing populism attacks elites. And it sees elites as being a set of out-of-touch individuals, who often have their own personal interests at heart rather than the interests of the common person. And that's where the conspiracism comes in and, and where the notions of uh, the elites being part of some sort of Jewish plot, whether they are Jewish themselves or whether they are uh, serving the interests of 
Jewish paymasters. And then there is an attack on people who are seen as low, <coughs> whether it's lower classes, whether it's undeserving minorities. In the sense of an undeserving group of people are attacked at the bottom in this kind of right-wing populism. And they are seen as being drains on the system. They are seen as being drains on the society. They are seen as being criminal elements who attack the vast common mass in this populist construction. So populism, right-wing populism, attacks elites and attacks the sort of undeserving underclasses whether they are class-based groups or racialized groups. So that's a sense of populism that, that carries over from classical fascism. And the last kind of aspect is that it again sees itself as avant-garde. It sees itself as being new and different and artistic in particular. And, and that artistic element of it is uh, very important in terms of contemporary organizing and in terms of contemporary strategies for recruitment and the way in which it presents itself in contemporary context. So those are the ways it is similar to classical fascism. Here are some of the ways that it is different. Here are some of the innovations that occur. First and foremost, it is a decentralized movement and a decentralized philosophy. Contemporary fascism has more or less dropped the notion of the charismatic leader and the cult of personality. Now, there are certain people who are personalities within a kind of fascist movement and, and a fascist uh, subculture, but they are not viewed with the same kind of Superman qualities that the fascist leaders of the 30s, 40s, and, and even 50s, 60s, etc. Uh, have had. So in the United States, what we see in particular is a strategy that they refer to as leaderless resistance. And leaderless resistance is a strategy that was developed consciously in the 1980s. The term came from a Klansman named Louis Beam. And Louis Beam came up with this term after the movement had suffered some losses with uh, the order, the terrorist group, and the Aryan Republican Army uh, being arrested and otherwise killed by federal agents in an effort to try to stop their terrorist efforts, and also in the context of pr prosecution, <coughs> in one case unsuccessful, in another case successful, prosecution of leaders of the National Alliance of the Aryan Nations in a conspiracy charge of forming the order, the white supremacist terrorist group. They were not convicted, but that scared them. And also the successful prosecution, at least in civil court, of Tom Metzger and the white Aryan resistance for the death of Mulekita Sarah in Portland, Oregon which led to the formal disbanding of his white Aryan resistance organization, but did not lead to Tom Metzger giving up his fight. That's a very important thing to understand about this notion of leaderless resistance. So the movement no longer has any sort of charismatic leader. What it has now, like a number of other movements, are people who serve as ideological inspirations and who encourage people to engage in individual level, uh, quote unquote, lone wolf tactics, that is individual level acts and uh, small cell violence. And rather than having one large organization, you have a web, a complex web of organizations and individuals who are constantly shifting in terms of who is on the rise, who is waning, so on and so forth, but the idea stays and the participants continue to be involved in, in a broader kind of movement. And so that's very important to understand that contemporary fascism is decentralized. And so in that kind of model, what they do is they argue for a minimal state involvement. So unlike classical fascism that wanted to overthrow the state and use the power of the state to impose its vision onto the world, uh, contemporary fascists are often very libertarian in their rhetoric. And the reason that they are libertarian in their rhetoric is partially because what we've seen, certainly since the civil rights movement, is that the states can act often as an agent of progressive change, certainly progressive racial change, but also because they've come into this logic of developing a new strategy for social change. Because 
they're not interested in the sort of classical building a mass party, working in electoral politics. They're more interested in what sociologists and scholars of social movements call prefigured change, where you create the world you want to see today and you build out from there. And so contemporary fascist movements are interested in building a world not of one large central state, but of small, democratically controlled societies with intense autonomy. So they're looking for, it, it's a, a, often they refer to it as like a racialized democracy. So that there's a democracy in particular for white people, and that there is a, often just a racial exclusion for anyone who's non-white. Or, of course, genocide of non-white persons. So this is, this is the idea. This is the future that they want. They're looking for a future, and they have these projects. Uh, you, know, you may have heard stories of them, about how they try to move into one location. Uh, in, you know, Cal they tried Kalispell, Montana. You may have seen uh, the documentary A Town Called Leaf, where a long time white supremacist tried to buy a tiny little town in North Dakota. You, know, you have these kinds of projects where they sort of build these worlds. And that was kind of the idea with the compounds, like the Aryan Nations and the National Alliance compounds, is to build these little area worlds. But that's the way they see the world, is that rather than being uh, an imperialist body, nations and regions should simply sort of take over and build their own kind of racial democracies for white people. And this is something that's shared across contemporary fascism, and actually across racial categories, which is really complicated. We can talk about that maybe today. So these are kind of the, the aspects. The last aspect is this idea of culture and lifestyle, as I already alluded to when talking about this, like, this notion of prefigurative space, right? In terms of lifestyle, you lead a life that is as close to the ideal as, as you can develop. You know, you try to lead a life that becomes increasingly surrounded by ideological others. Now that's really hard in contemporary American or, or European or frankly any global society. So what you do is when you have the ability, you kind of pull back into a world where you can listen to music, you can wear clothing, you can shop for products, you can do all of these things that align with your belief system of racial and ideological hatred. So that there is a complete and total culture, a subculture, and that the main place for recruitment for contemporary fascist movements is within subcultures, is within these cultural formations that are outside of normative culture, because that's where people who are most likely to listen to your message are going to be. They're going to be the people who are involved in sort of spectacular subcultures, uh, whether it's punk or black metal uh, or goth or even hipsters. Uh, you're going to go into online forums and you're going to basically uh, find people who are young and impressionable and use these sort of arguments of, you know, oh, I'm just doing it ironically, just quietly push messages of bigotry into these kinds of cultures. So this is, this is the, the key sort of aspect. So just to kind of sum up, summarize contemporary fascism, uh, it's a broad series of individuals, organizations, and institutions. And, and by institutions, I mean things like Richard Spencer's National Policy Institute. I mean uh, American Renaissance, Jared Taylor's uh, organization that do some of the intellectual work of this kind of movement. So it's a very, very broad movement. There isn't just like one group that you can point to. There isn't one leader you can point to. There isn't even one, you know, set of ideas, really. I mean, there are conflicting ideas here. Uh, there's an engagement through mass media, social media, and other forms of interaction, subcultural forms of interaction. So that the contemporary movement is one that really does look for opportunities to participate in mass media. That, that's where someone like Richard Spencer has been really good at leveraging mass media as the kind of handsome spokesman of the quote-unquote alt-right. Uh, 
and social media, where it's not, you know, as much as there's been a lot of stories about Russian bots, it's not just Russian bots. There are, in fact, lots of individuals out there who are not just engaging in aggressive trolling, but also engaging in less aggressive, much more subtle forms of online organizing. So this is, this is kind of what the movement is doing. And then last but not least, public demonstrations are different from the way in which uh, we have traditionally understood public demonstrations, including public demonstrations from the far right. Because we often, particularly people in this room who are used to a uh, history of engaging in progressive public demonstrations, use them as a way of petitioning, right? As demonstrating some sort of anger or frustration at some policy or some other issue that, that you want to voice your opinion on. Fascists have not been doing that, certainly not in the Trump era. What they're doing increasingly is using public demonstrations as quote unquote trolling events. They're using them as a means of basically trying to build anger, build frustration, and create conflict so that they can use that to internally message and recruit. Uh, which is why if you look at where they've been having their demonstrations, they've been to Berkeley a lot. They've been to Portland, Oregon a lot. Even Charlottesville is a college town with a progressive history. Boston, you know, when 40,000 people turned out, largely because it happened a week after Charlottesville. They are going to, surprisingly, honestly, I'm surprised they haven't been to Madison yet. <laughs> because what they're doing is they're going to the sort of liberal progressive spaces to try to anger people, to try to elicit a reaction. So this is what they're doing. They're intentionally, they're not going to where their base is. They're going, they're mobilizing their base to fight the enemy. And that's really important to understand, is that they're going to fight the enemy when they go to these cities. You know, they're going because it, it keeps, it creates a sense of solidarity with their base when they go to fight the enemy. So that's, that's the way to think about this. So let's flip a little bit. I'm going to try to do this rather quickly because we're looking at the time now. Uh, so anti-fascism. So let's look at the opposition. So anti-fascism, the way to think about anti-fascism is that it is a broad set of beliefs. And that anti-fascism is an ideological orientation towards opposing fascist organizing and opposing fascist movements. So that's it. To be an anti-fascist, that is all you have to do. At least that is the way that Nigel Copsey, a historian, defines anti-fascism. Uh, there are others who make a slightly different distinction between anti-fascism and non-fascism, so that uh, non-fascism is just that you don't like fascism, and anti-fascism is where you actually organize to oppose it in some way. I certainly I prefer that definition, personally, that anti-fascism requires you to take some action. Because nominally, frankly, the Republican Party is anti-fascist, as we may recall uh, in their denunciation of a certain candidate in Illinois. Uh, the RNC said, no, 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 he doesn't represent us, he's still running. Um, Google it. Uh, you know? So nominally, right, the Republican Party is non-fascist, is non but they're certainly not anti-fascist. We can talk about that soon. Uh, right, so anti-fascism, at least the way I construct it means that you try to take some sort of stance in opposition. You, you engage in some sort of, it's more than just being like, well, I don't like fascists. So that, that's the first thing to think about. But it is a broad range of positions, ranging from center-left liberals, because there are certainly people who are on the center-left who have taken stances, uh, to people who are far-left anarchists. So there, there's a very broad range of what anti-fascism can look like it is. And it's a broad range of tactical approaches. And that's something that's really important to remember when it comes to anti-fascism. Ranging from denunciation. So it, it is important to denounce, to strongly denounce, to not simply say, you know, you just don't, don't like that person, right? To, to really condemn a group to actual confrontation and direct action. 
there's a very broad range of tactics. And in social movement studies, we, we talk about how uh, basically tactics are infinite, and that our choice of tactics is developed by culture, by the circumstances on the ground, by strategy, by what's worked historically and what hasn't, so on and so forth. So it's important to understand that anti-fascism is the same thing. So let me focus a little bit on, on the sort of face of anti-fascism that we're most used to hearing about in the last year or so, and that is militant anti-fascism or anti -fascism. And in order to understand where I'm coming from here, uh, I did years of ethnographic and interview research with militant anti-fascists. So there are sort of two sides to the kind of research I do. I spent a lot of time looking at what fascists say online. I don't spend a lot of time talking to them. Uh, but, and then I spent time actually with anti-fascists. So this is where kind of this overview of Antifa comes from. So Antifa, uh, Basically, so anti-fascism itself has a long history, uh, and also in my recommended reading list, I recommend Mark Bray's uh, Antifa, the Anti-Fascist Handbook, because it's a very long history of anti-fascism going all the way back to the pre-World War II period, and tracing all anti-fascist activism to the present day, uh, and, and how it works in relation to fascist activism. So, highly recommend that book. Uh, but contemporary anti-fascism, what we know as Antifa, uh, has its origin in the 1970s and 1980s. And at that time, you had this kind of shift that I'm talking about in terms of the contemporary fascist movement. And it started to move away from large parties, it started to move to organizing with uh, smaller subcultural formations and things of that nature. And when it did that, it also met with stark opposition, particularly within those kinds of subcultures where they were recruiting, because a lot of those subcultures actually had a left-wing orientation <coughs> and saw fascism as a threat to the subculture as a whole, to what the subculture means for its participants. So the thing to understand about people who do Antifa is that they're actually rather ordinary. I know that's it may seem weird because the images we see are, you know, black masked people running at Richard Spencer and giving him a punch, uh, or you know, having sticks against armed uh, white supremacists or something like that. But underneath those masks are school teachers, seriously, nurses, you know. veterinary techs. I, I interviewed them. I spent time with them. You know, ordinary people, people no different from anyone in this room, are, are doing this kind of activism. So it's really important to understand that anti-fascists are not some sort of like alienated, strange characters. They are normal, ordinary people who are involved in a number of other progressive activism and see this as a particular strain of their activism. You know, this, this is related to their other forms of activism. Because fascists pose a threat to those other forms of activism as well. If they win, those activists lose. So it, it's important to understand that. Uh, but they have a kind of awareness of the fascist threat that, I'll be honest with you, because I interviewed people who do both the militants activism and people who do a non-militant activism. People who will hold rallies maybe at a different time or maybe will hold a rally at the same place but will make sure that it's not you know, violent or, or you know, taking any sort of confrontational direct action to stop a fascist event. So I interviewed all forms of anti-fascist activists here. And one of the things I noticed is that the less militant activists did not necessarily feel a sense of personal threat from the existence of fascist groups. I mean, they felt a threat that th these groups existed, but they didn't feel an everyday threat the way that the anti-fascists did. And the reason that the anti-fascists often felt an everyday threat is because for many of the people I interviewed, there was an aspect of themselves often, a per what I call a personal threat, that made them aware of the way in which fascists pose a unique threat. So there were people who were LGBTQ 
identified in their sexual orientation. There are people who are Jewish. There are people of color. There are people who basically their existence is threatened by fascist organizing. You know, so they become more militant activists because they see, a, a, you know, they see it as defense. The next were people who felt an ideological threat, a political threat, because they were involved in left-wing organizing, and fascists target left-wing organizers, and they target them with violence. You know, we, we see this quite frequently now, honestly, with doxing campaigns online. You know, that they're going after people, and they're making threats to them. And so they organize because, again, they're an actual threat and because they are often operating in the same spaces in terms of their organizing. The fascists are going after the same kind of base, young, working, and middle class people who feel alienated. And then lastly, there's a kind of that subcultural notion that when you're, I'm going to venture to guess that most people in this room have probably not been within, say, five, six feet of a neo-Nazi. I have long before I started doing this research. Because I came to this research uh, out of my own subcultural participation. And when I was 16 years old, I was in a record store buying records and a group of neo-Nazi racist skinheads came in to wholesale records to that record store. That was the first time I was ever in the same subcultural space with them. I've been to events where they really are about as far away as you are. And that's an existential threat. You know, so you have to understand where some of the militancy comes from in terms of a sense of an existential threat for militant anti-fascists. Uh, another thing that's really important to understand in terms of the tactics is that it's two things. One, as Mark Ray points out, most of what Antifa, what militants anti-fascists do, is actually nonviolent. It's a lot of research. It's a lot of, now they call it doxing, back in the old days they called it outing, because a lot of the time people who are fascists, they have jobs, they have kids, they, they have things that they don't, they don't want the world to necessarily know they're a fascist until they're doing their activism. You know? And so they would out them. They, they would engage in public shaming, because as much as the climate has changed a little bit, there's still a certain amount of shame involved with being in, in these kinds of politics, with being an overt racist. So a lot of it is just doing oppositional research. A lot of the kind of confrontational work is largely nonviolent. You know? It is largely fits within the framework of nonviolent civil disobedience. And even the violence is relatively rare. You know, so in order to understand that tactically. So there's a diversity of tactics being employed here. And the thing about the tactics is all of those tactics, including the violence, are effective. And we actually do have empirical proof of this. You know, we have some fairly good anecdotal evidence, such as Richard Spencer last week saying he doesn't want to do talks anymore because they keep getting disrupted by Antifa. And they're no fun for him. <laughs> so that's our anecdotal oh, evidence. Cool. Oh, oh, I know. <laughs> Uh, but then we also have empirical evidence. So if we have empirical evidence. We have studies of former white supremacists, uh, primarily in Europe, because access to these kinds of groups is really hard to do. And one of the things that white supremacists point out is that there is, in fact, a certain amount of strain and frustration that comes from being targeted by groups that oppose them. So, that help, you know, that leads to a certain amount of desistance. It leads to a certain amount of people just giving up. Because the thing to understand about anti-fascists, and, and this is what I'll sort of leave on and we can do q and uh, The thing to understand about anti-fascists is that they're not actually in their activism to change people's hearts and minds. I know this is going to seem very strange. They're in the activism to stop a movement. They're not coming from a political or a social psychological perspective where you want somebody on your side. They simply want those people to not organize against you. You know, because you, you often can't change a person's heart and mind, but you can keep them from recruiting other people, 
You can keep them from mobilizing the streets. You can keep them from doing things that help a movement grow. And that's where a lot of the kind of effectiveness of the tactics is, is that the effectiveness works from, again, in social movement studies, we call it counter-movement strategy. So that's how we can kind of understand fascism and anti-fascism broadly. I'll open it up to questions if we can talk specifically about Wisconsin, mm -hmm. if you'd like. And I know you had a question early on. Well, it, it's so. sort of tangential at this point, so you can. Oh. Okay. Um, I, yeah, there's one can you it, just talk about your impression of the Tea Party? And what your ah. understanding of it is, that's one part. And also, do you, are you, have you ever studied uh, Battle in Seattle, uh, the WTO mm -hmm. and all that? You yes. Can, if that's considered in this realm or Yes. Um, well, uh, I, I'll do first one first. Excuse me, group. Yeah. So I'll do the, the first one, and I'll talk about the Tea Party. Uh, the Tea Party is complicated. Right, you know, because the Tea Party is simultaneously, so the way to think about it is, uh, like a lot of, um, semi-mainstream conservative politics in contemporary American society. It's partially AstroTurf. You know, we, we know that it was funded a lot by Americans for Prosperity. We know that part of the way it was able to spread so quickly is because it had that funding, because it had the resources, obviously, to be able to move. But it did have a grassroots base. Now, that grassroots base is part of that populist approach that I was talking about, in that it does constitute a form of right-wing populism, and because it constitutes a form of right-wing populism, uh, what we saw in terms of the Tea Party is certain kinds of narratives, or, or what we sociologists call framing, that align a little bit with like actual fascists. But the Tea Party <coughs> itself was sort of on the, on the far right to mainstream of, of modern conservative politics. Uh, you know, there was some racialized discourse, but most of it did not reach the point of like total exclusion, you know, especially with the Tea Party's focus on opposing Obamacare. It was a lot of, you know, so they have, they sort of were more contributing to a climate of growth, you know, they, they were sort of, here's the best way I can do this. At a time when, so the Southern Poverty Law Center noticed or not noticed, but in their research, they found that after the election of Barack Obama, they, the number of hate groups in American society skyrocketed. Right? The Tea Party would represent the most moderate faction of that skyrocketing group, set of groups. So that, that's, that's the Tea Party. Now, uh, in terms of WTO in Seattle, uh, I did not go though my partner did, uh, so, and I had several friends there in various capacities, some standing behind flaming dumpsters, others uh, <laughs> marching in the streets, uh, and things like that. So I have a pretty good sense of, of how things went. And in terms of itself, I mean, if, if we think about it, I mean, to some extent it was very much a progressive victory, you know, in that they were able to disrupt the WTO meeting. It was also one of the first times that you saw these kinds of efforts of fascist groups to try to piggyback on some of these uh, progressive concerns to build their agenda. So that there were, at the time, there were groups like the World Church of the Creator and the National Alliance who attended those protests, who even tried to insert themselves into some of the more radical factions and were rebuffed. Uh, I person uh, I was not there to witness that, but I read accounts that said that they did. I was, however, at the Free Trade Area of the Americas protest in Quebec City, and I very literally witnessed people uh, chasing down uh, fascists who tried to attend those protests and uh, forcing them to leave or at least give up their uh, fascist symbols. They, they were carrying... Uh, Actually, it was really weird. It was sort of like these fascist Quebec nationalists. So one of them had a Quebec flag, and the other one had a Confederate flag. And they they got those flags. They burned said flags, and uh, the the people were told basically they weren't welcome at the protest. So that that's something I witnessed. Of, you know, as, as part of my own progressive activism. So whenever they sort of try to insert themselves into progressive movements, they've been rebuffed fairly quickly. So that that's 
that's what I can say to that. So that's where you were headed. Um, so yes, you had a question. Um, I was curious if you could discuss uh, an aspect of fascism that I've always been really interested in, and that is in classical fascism. My understanding is that they embraced the idea of the corporatized state mm. as a mechanism of their politics, i.e. in placing um, corporate CEOs in places of political power that could make law. Where do modern contemporary fascists fit with that concept and that pillar of how do you organize a political movement? Okay. I don't see that. So Where is that? I, I would say two things. Uh, one, uh, that, that the, the oft-quoted statement that is attributed to Benito Mussolini is apparently apocryphal. He didn't actually say it. So oh, we'll, we'll start with that. Uh, we'll start with that. However, there is a, so corporatism, as a sociologist, corporatism is a concept that, that is used in my discipline. And what corporatism means is simply a society where it is organized around group interests. So there are different forms of corporatism. Uh, in fact, a lot of progressive politics also relies on a kind of form of corporatism in terms of a, you know, this sort of federated democratic representation that we, we hope to have in, in a progressive society. Now, fascists do have their own form of corporatism. So, Mussolini, <coughs> so for example, Hitler and Mussolini believed in a right-wing corporatism where certain aspects of your identity would be uh, what we call a master status in sociology. So if you were a worker, you would be organized in the society as a worker, and then you would be controlled by the state in a top, remember that top-down hierarchy, right? So all, so the Nazis loved unions, right? They didn't love unions as a bottom-up democratic force. They loved unions as a top-down force that could be controlled, right? So that the Nazis would have a labor minister who would then go to the heads of the unions, who would then tell the unions that this is what you're gonna do. And that you know, if you love the state, right? Where does Alec get into that? You know, okay. Legislation. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so here's the thing that's interesting about contemporary fascism: is that contemporary fascism opposes the notion of these kind. You know, they see economic elites as basically either just straight up. Uh, protocols of the elders of Zion, Jewish conspiracy, you know, hidden puppet masters who are running everything. So Alec is really just a, a Zionist Jewish organization for them. Uh, or they are the people who are running corporations who might not be overtly Jewish are, you know, doing the work of this sort of Zionist conspiracy. How about selling our roads to the Spanish? Uh, where does yeah. that fit into their, their world view? Are they yeah. mad about that? I, are fascists, uh, yes, are, are they? yes, they are. Because what they posit, again, is direct, you know, what, what they're positing, because they understand that this works in an American context, but it also works in a French context, in a German context. I mean, there's a reason that the Front National, uh, you know, and, and so on and so forth, have done so well. You know, that UKIP, you know, I mean, there's some issues around Brexit, but UKIP did well for a while there, right? You know, they, they are doing well, because what they do is their answer to the structural problems of contemporary society is retreat, right? Retreat to the smallest form of organization that you can. Retreat to, you know, so they talk a lot about like faith and folk, and you know, they use these kind of very fascist rhetoric of like faith and folk and kin and, and identity and, and things that, you know, and, and they use identity not in the same way that people on the left do. They, they use it in this way of, of sort of, I, you know, of pure racial identity. Who right. are they mad at when they find out that your, the road you're driving on is owned by some Spanish executive? Are they mad at who? Jewish they, people. Mm. The Jews. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, in the end, it's the Jews. You know? when, it, because that's a, I, I recently should, I teach a course on this. And, and yesterday, not yesterday, the day before, I, I showed uh, Blood in the Face, which is a 30 year old documentary at this point. But I still show it because it's still relevant, so on and so forth. Um, but they, they point out, they're like, you know, there's a, a person in the film, his uh, um, because he's 30 years old, who says, you know, well, who is the Jew? You know, and, and they say, well, we would say that, like, Jerry Falwell is a Jew. We would say, you know, uh, Billy Graham is a Jew. Because they serve this system, right? So the whole system, the way everything is organized, is for them ultimately a Jewish conspiracy. And so 
when you, you know, globalization is a Jewish plot to create a multi-ethnic society. That, this is why they talk, the, the new term is white genocide. So if you, you know, if you paid attention at all, a couple years ago there was a controversy with uh, George Sikora Meyer. Uh, he's a, he was a professor at Drexel. Uh, he's, I forget where he's moved to, but he's got now kind of a research position. Um, because he was forced out of Drexel because they targeted him so hard that they started threatening his class. They started sending bomb threats to his professor's course. And for, he tweeted out this sarcastic tweet that said, all I want for Christmas is white genocide. Because they have this frame among these fascist movements that there's this white genocide going on. That white people are being eliminated from the face of the earth. You know, because it because they pay attention to the same stuff that we do and, and look at the demographics, you know, the sort of imagine 2050, which is actually a, 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 a name think tank or, or a blog that writes about like, issue, progressive issues. Um, but they, you know, they see 2050 coming and they see 2050 as, you know, oh my God, we're, we're dying out. We're white people, we're gonna be gone. You know, they see refugees as coming into Europe and destroying, right, you know, destroying European culture. It's the Islamophobic kind of narrative. But ultimately, they see all of that as part of a Jewish plot. Because Jewish people have, <coughs> since the beginning of time, been placed on, on this earth to destroy and oppose and, and test the, the metal of good, caring Christian people. I I, or I should say good, caring white people, because a lot of them are Christian. I'd like to just ask one more quick one question. One more question, and then okay. we'll get to the gentleman in the back. I've observed the rise of fascism around the globe. Mm -hmm. Golden Dawn in Greece, mm -hmm. Le Pen in France, yep. Boris Johnson, is that his name, in, in, in England? Or who's the other guy? That, the uh, Nigel Farage. Who, Farage. Yep. So, quick what? why? Why? Uh, what's largely the, what's the, what's the, because for, for the same reason that we are seeing increasingly a rise in fascism in this country. Because the way in which, so the system, and, and this is where things get complicated, this is where fascists can kind of win. So we, we live in a system, and for sociologists, the system is a way of organizing all social life, right? Uh, so we live in a system that is organized, at least economically, right? Well, we, we sort of think about like intersecting systems. Right? So there, there are systems that are economic, there are systems that are non-material, such as race and gender and sexual orientation, uh, physical ability, things of that nature. Um, but when we look at the economic system, right, so the economic system is set up in such a way that, oh, you know, and, and I don't mean to get terribly Marxist on, on everybody, like, you, know, you don't have to be Marxist to agree with this, and like, Milton Friedman agrees with this, he just likes this idea, uh, that, right, Capitalism is set up in such a way that winners increasingly will be wealthier and losers <coughs> will increasingly be poorer, right? Like that, that is simply the way the system works. That's, I mean, there's no disagreement there. <laughs> like whether you're a Marxist or, or a free market capitalist, you just, how much you love or hate it, right? <laughs> you know, so that's the, that's the reality of the world we live in, right? <coughs> and that reality has been increasingly exacerbated by globalization. You know, in, in the United States and, and throughout Europe and, and places like Greece, you know, you, you have this exacerbated by uh, deindustrialization. You have, uh, you know, in Europe, part of the problem is that they built a social safety net under the successes of uh, the kind of post-war industrial buildup, and then globalization kicks in, and so you can't afford the safety net because you don't have the you know, the, the sort of tax revenue coming in. And so the fascists come in and they promise you the safety net. But they promise you the safety net by saying, we're gonna, you know, remember that, that sort of hitting the people who are most vulnerable? Right, and they go, well, we're gonna kick the vulnerable people out. And then the safety net will be fine for you. You know, if you think of like Golden Dawn, right? Golden Dawn is like, we're gonna kick refugees out, we're gonna kick immigrants out. You know, uh, that, was, that was Nigel Farage when we think about, you. sorry, um, you know, maybe we'll go over just <laughs> yeah, but you know, they, they ran these buses that were like, you know, there's going to be all this money for the NHS because we're going to kick all of these, you know, mostly Polish and Eastern European people out because they can come here, you know, because under the European Union, you were allowed free travel and to work without having to do work visas and all that stuff, you know, and, and they were basically like, we're going to kick all these people out and we're going to promise jobs for everybody and we're going to, you know, they'll all be kicked off the national health and the national health will be strengthened. And then, of course, you know, Brexit passes 
And, you know, he gets up there and he's like, <laughs> yeah, we didn't believe that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's just structurally, because the economic impact of Brexit is going to like, defund their tax base. So I'm sorry. Um, perhaps in contrast to Western Europe, maybe not. Um, what we seem to be experiencing today with the Trump administration, uh, and to a lesser extent here in the state of Wisconsin with Walker, mm -hmm. uh, is much more similar to classical fascism than contemporary mm -hmm. fascism. I mean, in the United States, I think we obviously we've got both, but the dominant power seems to be yeah. at least prefiguring or you know pre-shadowing whatever. Um, Classical fascism. Could you comment on yeah, that? Yeah, <laughs> I can. Uh, what I would actually say is that uh, what we see in terms of, and this is to some extent is true in Europe, Western Europe, you know, it's, it's just true globally. Uh, you, you have fascist movements in Malaysia, you know, in Japan. They're, they're, they're everywhere. And what, what you see with someone like Donald Trump uh, and with Scott Walker is less of sort of classical fascism and more of the outcome of a kind of Ayn Randian nihilism. You know, that, that they, they sort of pay a certain amount of lip service to tradition and to moral values and things of that nature, but their real interest is to create an, an entirely laissez-faire society where the only value is the value of wealth, you know, and, and in that sense, it, it's more nihilistic than it is, than it is the sort of order of fascism. Because whether it's classical fascism or contemporary fascism, they promise a certain kind of order, right? A certain kind of order in the you know they, they talk about. So there, there's a really interesting <coughs> uh, recruitment video or, or sort of an advertising video that Richard Spencer put together for the National <coughs> Policy Institute where they talk about, you know, it's, it's all about this sort of notion of like, who are you, right? And, and he really sort of stresses how like, he doesn't say race ever, you know, he doesn't say white ever, but it is very much like, your identity gives you history, give, you know, right? It gives you something to cling to, you know, heritage. it gives you- Your heritage. Your heritage, yes, your oh, heritage. Okay. You know, it, it gives you some sense of order. And, and that's the thing about fascists, right? It's that like, classical fascists, they, they want, they have order. You know, and if capitalism disrupted that order, classical fascists were fully willing to like, you know, step in and do something about it. And they did. And they did exactly. You know, contemporary fascists are the same thing, right? It, it, you know, they see disorder in cap. They actually see disorder in capitalism. And, and again, they see it as a Jewish plot. But you know, they, they see disorder in capitalism and they say, well, we, you know, what we need is an order of, you know, n know your heritage, live in small communities where everybody is like you, right? Shares your values shares your beliefs, and in those communities, you won't have those excesses of capitalism, right? Because, you know, if we live in a world of like small sort of combination of like free enterprise and, and you know, the, the sort of compassion of, of the, the, you know, where everybody's like kind of like family, then, then that's gonna solve the problem of chaos, right? Whereas the laissez-faire policies of, of Republican politics, and, and it really does extend to Donald Trump and his economic and, and you know, other policies are really just about like take what you can and screw order and screw the rules. Smash right? Yes, yeah, so it is. Yeah, smash and grab. Yeah. Well, then. <laughs> okay, then what is the distinction? And I'm thinking of Nancy McLean's book on radical libertarianism, mm -hmm. Ayn Rand, and yeah. so forth. But, um, you know, what's the distinguishing point between yeah. radical libertarianism mm -hmm. and any form of fascism? Uh, libertarian is more like a religion. How do you know? <laughs> no. I, but what I would say is that radical libertarian, or I would say reactionary libertarianism, because liberty, the thing about libertarianism, <laughs> it's, it's a, you know, it really is a term from the left. Like we, we had it first in Europe. It was coined in Europe to refer to anarchists, to libertarian socialists. Mm -hmm. And it's in the 1950s that uh, the Chicago School economists decided libertarianism was going to be their term to try to insert it into the discourse of American politics as an alternative. So what we're talking about here is reactionary libertarianism, and reactionary libertarianism is, you know, it, it's sort of built on 
it's built on kind of the the elements of classical liberalism of the free individual, and the free individual is seen as consistent and the with what's known as like rational choice theory or rational choice philosophy, that the free individual is, is always a rational character and actor. And that, you know, and, and oh, always has perfect information, of course. Uh, you know, and, and so what we, what we see within, if you look within, right, if you start to kind of look within libertarianism, what you see is somewhere between just, like I said, nihilism, right? If there's nothing but the market. Or neo-feudalism that the market will simply create a series of private hierarchies, which is essentially feudalism, right? You know, they, they talk about having like private courts, and private courts are going to you know, adjudicate disputes, and if there are two private courts that disagree Those with each other, block. we're gonna go to, yeah, yeah Walter Block loves that stuff. Um, you know, and that, that's libertarianism, whereas fascists, whether, you know, classical fascists, we're like, we're gonna have one leader, we're gonna do what the leader says, that's it. And, you know, neo-fascists, are, you know, are less about the one leader and more like we're going to make sure that we live in these like racial and ethnic homogenous communities and we're just going to take care of each other. It was very different from libertarians. The libertarians, you don't take care of anyone. You know, right. screw you. Right. It's sort of middle finger to everyone. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. but, so, I'm sorry, you wanted to, we can just chat after. Okay. Yeah.